Hello, I am Herman Aguinis uh, from George Washington University, and I am delighted to deliver this two-part keynote presentation for the Academy of Management Specialized Conference in Mexico. This is a two-part presentation because the first one is what you're watching right now, which has been pre-recorded, and the second part will be live streaming a real-time question and answer session in which participants will get a chance to ask questions and it will be more interactive. And I very much look forward to that. Before I start, I wanted to say that these are truly unprecedented times. And my thoughts and prayers are with all of those who have been affected by this pandemic. This is a true tragedy. It is also unprecedented in the sense that you turn on the TV and you see scientists talking about research. You listen to the radio or turn on your computer and you watch politicians talk about research, presenting models, graphs, data, policymakers debating which model is more credible, which model is more trustworthy, what decisions should they make based on the data the scientists are presenting. Research credibility has never been more important than now. So I am going to talk about some critical challenges going on right now, not only in management, but also, as we know, in many other fields, because we're watching those debates unfold on TV almost on a daily basis. First of all, is the knowledge we create credible? Can we replicate our research results? If a team of researchers conducts a study and creates certain results and conclusions, can I do the same study or a similar study and reach similar conclusions? How is this replicability or lack thereof affecting scholars and educators in management and in other fields? And what can we do about this? So first of all, I am going to talk about the credibility crisis in science and management in particular. Something I call the perfect storm on torturing the data until they confess how talent management can help us understand what I believe is a research performance problem and also offer some of our modest proposals based on our own research. First of all, the credibility crisis in science. Between 30 and 60% of published studies can now be replicated across a number of scientific fields, meaning psychology, economics, management. But this is not just a social science problem. As we see unfolding on TV almost on a daily basis, questions about which model is correct which model is more trustworthy about the COVID-19? Now, which predictions are accurate? How were things measured? And if a different team of researchers analyzes the same data, will they come up with the same conclusion as the original team of researchers? In fact, a, a survey uh, based on authors uh, of the journal Nature, which publishes natural science research, uh, showed that the vast majority of researchers believe there is a credibility crisis because we're not able to replicate the research that is published. What is the situation in economics? Very similar. In economics, a very large number of studies can now be replicated based on the articles published in their top journals. Not only that, but when we try to replicate the same studies, we obtain results that are different. Different meaning overall weaker. They are smaller in size and statistical significance is not as significant as in the original studies. The same situation we see in other fields, for example, in strategic management, a study we conducted um, just a couple of years ago. In this case, we did not replicate. What we did, we tried to reproduce, that is, we extracted the correlation matrices 
publishing these articles and then re-ran the same analyses that those authors conducted in their original studies. What did we find? That we could not obtain the same results reported in these original articles by using their same data. So this is not replicability. This is what we call reproducibility. We're just simply trying to reproduce the same things they did with their data, uh, not collecting additional data. And what's happening in qualitative research is similar situation in which we have found that qualitative research sometimes is not sufficiently transparent. So we're not able to know exactly what has been done in the published articles that have used qualitative research. And this is based on a study recently published just a few months ago in a strategic management journal. So what is happening right now? I call this the perfect storm. Have you seen the movie, The Perfect Storm? So the perfect storm means that if you have a bunch of dangerous situations that happen by themselves, the situation is typically bad. But if all of these factors happen at the same time, you have a catastrophe. And that's what that movie is all about. And in our field, in management, but also I believe in economics and psychology and some of the natural sciences, we are seeing a perfect storm. Number one, the pressure to publish in top journals. We have heard recruiting committees, tenure and promotion committees use the phrase, that doesn't count. If it's a publication not included, on the list of A journals, it just doesn't count. So the pressure to publish in a smaller and smaller number of journals is incredibly high. If you don't publish in those journals, you don't get promoted, you don't get hired, so the pressure is on. Number two, increase, increased methodological sophistication. Methods have improved tremendously in the last couple of decades. So there is a need for researchers to be able to publish in these top journals to know the latest methodological developments. At the same time, we have business schools who are allocating less and less money, less and less resources to doctoral training and also faculty training and retooling. And the reason is quite easy to understand. Doctoral programs, for the most part, do not make as much money in the short term for a school compared to an MBA program or an undergraduate program. So many deans decide to not put money and resources into a doctoral program. And overall, many professors are asked to be what I call Da Vinci academics. Da Vinci was a strategist. He knew about engineering. He was an inventor. He was a chemist. He was a physicist. So he did it all. So in a way, I believe this perfect storm uh, has one additional factor, which is faculty are required to be Da Vinci academics. We need to do it all. So here's another, another analogy that I'd like to uh, draw your attention to. A French restaurant entree. A couple of years ago, my wife and I went to a fantastic restaurant in Chicago at the Academy of Management Conference. This French restaurant served a perfect entree. Everything was in place. The texture, the smell, the quality of the food, the placement on the plate, and of course, the taste. Everything was just perfect. Then my wife and I went home that evening, and the following day, we tried to make the same entree. And of course, we couldn't. Why? Because we did not know the 20, 30, maybe 100 trials and errors and steps that the chef engaged in before finally arriving at this perfect, at this perfect final product. In many ways, the journal articles published in management and many other fields look like the French entree. Everything is perfect. Hypotheses are supported. 
measures were valid, assumptions were met. Frankly, that's not how it typically works in my own research. But when you read articles published in our top journals, they do look like the perfect product, like the perfect French restaurant entree. And I believe what's happening is that we are torturing the data until they confess. What do I mean by that? I mean that what's happening in the research, research kitchen is not known by the readers, by the consumers of that final product. How were variables selected in the model? For example, if researchers were extracting data from a database and started with 30 or 40 variables, and then eventually only reported the six or seven that resulted in a really good thinning model. We just don't know what was the starting point of modeling. Use of control variables. We sometimes see that an article reports the final set of the control variables, but we do not know if other control variables were included and then later excluded from the final model. How were outliers managed or handled? Perhaps a team of researchers found an outlier that is a data point very far from everybody else. And if you take the outlier out, model fit improves. If you leave it in, model fit is worse. So what did, what did researchers do? What decisions were made about the management of outliers and how that affected model fit? Was it a priori decision or was it a decision based on how my model or my final product looks in the end? How about reporting p-values? Of course, the pressure to report statistics that are statistically significant, lower than 0.05. If we get something that is 0.49, that we play around with the data and maybe add another variable, remove a control variable, how we handle missing data, so that we can just get that p-value just, just under 0.05. So we, we need, we'd like to get that value at 0.049 instead of 0.051. So we can report a statistically significant value. Hypothesizing after results are known, we may find that a hypothesis is not supported, but then we look around and look at the correlation matrix and run some analysis and find that we do find some relationships and then retroactively write a whole section in the introduction of the paper providing a rationale for this hypothesis, which was not really a hypothesis, it was a, an empirical finding after the fact. Many of these uh, issues we describe in our Academic Management Annals article in which we talk about criteria for transparency which will be useful for authors, but also for journal editors and reviewers as well. So talent management actually gives us some good theories to explain what is going on. And we can describe this situation as a performance problem. And in this case, it's a research performance problem. In the literature on performance management and performance, there are two major factors that cause high or low performance. One, knowing how to do the job, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Two, the need or the desire to do the job well, motivation. And both are needed. We need both knowledge on how to do the job and the desire to want to do the job well. So what's happening right now in our field and many other fields that might, ex might explain our inability to replicate and reproduce is that number one, as I mentioned, because of the lack of resources and the advancements in methods, many researchers and perhaps reviewers do not have the opportunity to acquire the knowledge and skills and abilities to conduct high level research that will be uh, replicable. On the other hand, uh, researchers may know how to do that, but the motivation to hark, the motivation to manage outliers and use control variables to get results that are significant is so powerful that even if one knows how to 
use the methods appropriately, there's a very strong motivation to engage in certain practices, what we call questionable research practices, to be able to publish our papers in the top journals and obtain the desired rewards. So that is what we're facing right now, a research performance problem. We're on, the, on the one hand, we have reduced training for doctoral students, methodology also being outsourced from business schools to other schools, and a bunch of factors that, that go against the acquisition of KSAs. And we also have the motivation to, to publish in these um, A journals only. So what are some of our modest proposals? The proposals uh, are described in many of these papers available on my website, and they deal with these two factors. On the one hand, training, so learning how to do research well, how to use the latest methodological tools, and on the other hand, how to motivate researchers, journal editors, and reviewers to produce research that is more credible, more trustworthy, and that we can replicate. And many of these articles uh, deal with both of those issues, the KSA angle and the motivation angle. The 2019 article in SMJ is about 12 transparency criteria specifically for qualitative research, which is an area in which the conversation on replication and replicability and credibility hasn't really taken place yet. So in this paper, we bring the issue of credibility and transparency to the qualitative research methods domain. The Aguinness, Cummings, uh, Romney and Cummings 2020 Academic Management Perspectives paper discusses this pressure to publish in A journals. And what are the positive and the negative consequences of that? And what can we do with the issue that the motivation to publish in A journals is so strong that it's driving a lot of the behaviors that leads to research that cannot be replicated, reproduced, and therefore could not be so credible or trustworthy. And similarly, in our paper in OBHDP, which was published just a few weeks ago, we try to show journal editors that engaging in some of these practices that enhance the credibility of research are not very costly, are not very time consuming. For example, one, one of the 10 solutions we offer is to uh, provide the possibility that instead of submitting the full paper to a journal to be evaluated for possible publication, researchers can submit a proposal or a registered report or a pre-registered report, which is essentially what we do with doctoral dissertations. A doctoral dissertation does not include the results of the research. It includes the theory, the methods, the measures, what data will be collected, and how the data will be analyzed without reporting the results or what the results mean. And then that research proposal is accepted or not based on the merit of its quality, regardless of what the results are. So we're proposing that one way of increasing credibility and trustworthiness and decreasing the pressure to engage in questionable research practices is for journals to have a track where papers can be, can be submitted in a proposal manner as opposed to a full manner. I described the Academic Management Annals article on transparency. And we also have several other papers published in GIFs, JAP, Journal Business Venturing, um, the one in uh, Personal Psychology in 2016 describes best practices in the use of control variables. Many of these papers include checklists um, and things that authors can do, things that reviewers can do as a review, evaluate a paper, for example, that used control variables. And most of these papers have questions such as, did the paper do this? Did the paper do that? And you can not only use that to make a decision, uh, in terms of whether the paper should be accepted or not, but more importantly, in terms of giving authors developmental feedback on how they can improve their papers and their research. 
Same thing with the paper uh, in organizational research methods on outliers from 2013. We have a, a graph in which we show a sequence of steps that researchers can go through as they make decisions on whether they have an outlier or not, what kind of outlier they have, and how to handle the outlier, and how to report how the outlier has been handled. So talent management, research and theories are very useful because as we watch TV and we hear scientists debating the credibility of different models about the pandemic and politicians trying to make decisions and policymakers trying to make decisions about which model is more credible, we have to understand that everything starts with transparency. And that issue of transparency and trustworthiness is definitely affecting management as well. And in fact, it could be one of the reasons why there's such a gap between science and practice in management, meaning that there's a lot of research producing management, but many managers do not use the research that we produce. In closing, the articles that I just described are available on my website, and I very much look forward to the live streaming presentation in which we will be able to interact real time and discuss uh, many of these issues. Thank you very much, and I look forward to it.